Hello, everyone. Uh, how are you doing? How, how is Slush going? Uh, big, big turnout. I'm very glad that you've, you've stuck around with us, despite the fact that it is nearly 5 p.m. and people are getting ready for their, <laughs> their evening activities uh, tonight. But very glad you've decided to, to stick with us. Um, yeah, I'm really glad to have uh, Jessica Neal, a partner at TCV, former Chief People Officer of, of Netflix, and Laurie Ann, uh, Chief People Officer of, of Kavak, massive Mexican news car marketplace, uh, global business you know, with, with huge recognition globally, um, to talk about a pretty interesting topic which I think a lot of people are uh, talking about already here at Slush, you know, this idea of talent, what it takes to build a successful company that is cognizant of the issues and challenges around bringing in excellent talent um, and then scaling that globally. Um, it's a fascinating t t uh, topic. Uh, Lorianne, just to, to start with yourself, you know, uh, co-founder of Kavak, started with uh, you know, an operation in, in Mexico, grew that worldwide. Um, I'd love to hear from yourself you know, a few anecdotes about what it was like to even start a company. I mean, where did you look in terms of trying to find the right talent, the right people to build the company that, that is Kavak today? Great, happy, so happy to be here, full of energy. This is an, an amazing event. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit, you know, I think that when we decided to start Kavak, the first thing that we said is like, we need to have a problem that is big enough for us to solve, to be really engaged and to have the solution to be able to solve it and the product. And the third piece, which is very important, is talent. And how we're going to find people that are actually going to commit their day to day and waking up every morning to, to fill this idea and make sure that we deliver the product. And, and at the beginning, you end up being a stalker pretty much. Uh, we were LinkedIn stalkers, uh, emailing people and asking them and making sure that they would at least answer and, and respond to what we were thinking because at the beginning it, it was very pitch mode. So the first recruits, we used to spend a lot of time pitching and telling them, this is what we're building, this is how big it's going to be, this is why we're the right people to build it, and these are all the people that are helping us build it. And after that, we got their attention we made sure that we made that dating process long enough for them to visit our operation, get to know the team. And once we saw that spark in their eyes, that's when we switched to recruiting mode. And we're like, OK, now we know that you love this. Let's start <laughs> with a very rigorous process so people knew that they were joining something amazing and then celebrate and make sure that they felt very valued and very part of what we were going to build uh, later on. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's interesting just kind of hearing, you know, even trying to inspire people to be part of that journey, part of that mission. Um, and Jessica, you know, former chief people officer of, of Netflix, um, scaled the company to thousands of, of, of people. I mean, I'm sure you as well would have some experience of uh, what it's like to, to drive uh, you know, a successful company um, on, on the people front. I mean, yeah, just in terms of, you know, to, to Laurie Ann's point around how you actually convince people to believe in that mission to come on board. I mean, how do you go about it, you know, when, when obviously Laurie Ann was talking about the start of the, the journey, but, you know, Netflix, when you kind of grew beyond the sort of the DVD <laughs> business that we all know from back in the day to the streaming giant it is today, I mean, how did you sort of look at attracting talent and, and, and bringing people on board? Yeah, well, when we were DVD, nobody wanted to work there, so it was a lot, <laughs> a lot harder. But um, I think it becomes even more complex when you do have a bit of a brand, because then you are a destination that people want to be at. And then it's really figuring out who the best people are, right? And that's the hardest part. And I think, you know, having a saturation of talent within your company and building a high-performance culture takes a ton of work. And so it's a ton of work attracting the right people and figuring out how you're going to assess them, how you're going to see that spark. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and when you come to work, you're coming to do something that you're passionate about with a special group of people to do it with. And there's, when you get it right, there's nothing like that. But you don't always get it right. So as much effort as you put on the front end and sort of building the pipeline and selling and getting the right people in, you're going to make tons of mistakes. And so when you don't get it right, you have to be equally aggressive about correcting that. And then that's how you can, you know, 
kind of saturate the company with more talent. And yeah. I think a lot of companies struggle with the, the sort of middle group, which I call the, the good layer. You kind of have your superstars, you have your duds, those are easy to figure out. But it's all the people in the middle that are good. And, and how do you move them to greatness? And if you can't, then how do you be honest about that in a graceful, genuine way and be good at saying goodbye? Totally. And this is something I really want to yeah, ask, ask both of you about. Um, you know, that problem, or not a problem in, in many cases, but just, just that, that hurdle of trying to attract people to a company that is going through the motion of, of scaling and becoming massive and, and growing really fast. You take on more people you know, in operations across the world, and it, it, you might lose some visibility over what exactly you're, you're managing and, and who's where and, and things like that. Um, you know, how does that you know, work for, for a company like, you know, in, in your case at the time, Jessica, you know, Netflix, um, you know, trying to kind of realize these are the ingredients that, that I need to fulfill that mission of keeping talent, not just getting talent in the first place, but keeping that and keeping them believing in, in the company and, and, and the pace of its growth. Yeah, and I think, um, I don't know, I think this idea of keeping and retaining is maybe the wrong lens. Right. I think it's, um, look, I don't want to keep you if you don't want to be there, <laughs> you know, but if you want to be there and you're amazing, of course, I want to keep you. But I think um, being honest about um, a working relationship and being honest about the phases that a human goes through in their personal journey around their career and around their family and around their life, right? And then also the company has its own journey, right? And yeah. sometimes those journeys can be on the same path for many, many, many years and you're able to flex and adapt, but sometimes you want different things. And, you know, if you're, you know, when we were a startup at Netflix and doing DVDs, what, what was great then wasn't great when we were going into streaming and, mm. and going global. We needed a different skill set. And some people from the, the beginning scaled, you know, all the way and, and some people didn't. But I think if you can have a culture of honesty to have direct conversations about what's working and what's not, yeah. um, it, it, it produces for a, a, a much more conducive team and, and trustworthy environment where you don't feel like it's a failure, you feel like it's a success. And isn't it a wonderful thing to be a great place to be from mm. versus just a good place to be at? Yeah, yeah. Um, Laurie-Anne, I mean, any, any thoughts, uh, you know, as well um, on that kind of issue, you know, Kavak being a company that, that started from a, a very, you know, small point, but, you know, now is scaled and... and You've got lots of capital and, you know, a $9 billion valuation. I mean, this is a much bigger business we're talking about than it was right at the start. You know, what were some of the kind of learnings that you found along the way as, as, you, as you grew the company? Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree, you know, with, with what you're saying. Uh, the people at the beginning, it's very different than the people that you're going to need after you're scaling and you're becoming a very big and global company. And, and it's about, you know, making sure that during this trip, you have the people that are there at that precise moment where you need them and that they can grow along the way. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you're growing together as a company. And so Kavak is growing, but these people are growing and maybe if it's the time for them to go to have another challenge in another team or in another place, it's be being honest about doing that because the company changes and the culture changes. You just need to be very intentional about how it changes so it doesn't surprise you and you're like, where, where am I now, right? So you know where it's kind of going. Um, and some people want to change with that, and some people, you know, want something different. And when it comes to the the, the sell, you know, for, for a tech company, you know, oftentimes it, it's the, the place to go for, for people who are, are looking for, you know, a, a new role, um, you know, something that's very challenging in many ways, but, you know, exciting in others. Um, but there, there's different ways to do this, right? You know, you have salaries on the one hand, and I mean, Lord knows tech has seen uh, <laughs> inflation when it comes to, you know, salaries um, and expectations. Um, seeing some kind of pressure against that view uh, nowadays, given the sort of challenges that we're seeing economically. Um, when it comes to today, uh, maybe Laurie-Anne, to start with you and, and, and uh, Jessica, if you could pitch in as well, 
how do you figure out like what are the best ways to get the right talent and make those pitches in terms of the salaries that are on offer? You had this war for talent that existed in 20 and 21. Now we're in a very different year, you know, after 22, in which we kind of saw the economic signs go the other way. How do you kind of convince people to sort of you know, stay in, invested um, on, on, a, on a personal no. level and financial level? Yeah, and I think if you add to that, um, if, if you go back to Latin America and the entrepreneurship ecosystem that we had, it was basically non-existent. Mm. So you had people that had a very, the talented people had a very clear career path with a very clear financial incentives aligned to it. And you're convincing them to join entrepreneurs that have not been successful in the past. And you're telling them, don't worry, we are going to make it. We are going to be successful. So we really had to engage people with a vision and engage people with a dream of being the first group of entrepreneurs that were actually going to be able to make something big and open doors for other entrepreneurs. Because we had to bring in people that were sacrificing maybe half percent of their salary versus an equity that they didn't understand. And that yeah. people that just wanted to build this. And I think that that's what made us very successful as well, because people were really in it to build something, something that was lasting, something that was going to change the entrepreneurship ecosystem in, in the region. And I think that's why people still, you know, keep, of course, after fundings, we're now able to pay decent salaries. Uh, but at the beginning, it was very <laughs> difficult. Thanks, Lee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Jessica. Well, you know, we had a, a slightly different philosophy at Netflix where, you know, even from the beginning, we wanted to pay the best. And so, um, you know, our, our thought was that we'd rather pay someone top dollar that was amazing versus three average people because we knew that if we pay top dollar, even though we were a startup, that um, their work would 10x the work of the three average people. Yeah. And so um, we just sort of went all in on that. Um, from the beginning. And, and the result of that was that we had less people, but it was actually a good thing because we got done with a lot less people. Leaner business. Yes, and, and it was more scrappy and it was faster and it was more agile. And then, um, you know, we, we weren't sort of dragging along this, this other group of people who, you know, may not have been the perfect fit, yeah. right? So. That, that that's a very tough thing to approach as well, you know, I mean, when it comes to the right profile of, of person that you need at the right time, um, you know, and again, going back to the kind of the shifts that we've seen over the past couple of years, there's been this kind of, you know, I guess, flight to quality, uh, you know, both on a, a, a company and business point, but also, you know, in terms of the people who are right for that role at, at the given time. Um, I mean, Jessica, when you sort of look at the environment at the moment, um, you know, and trying to find the right fit, what is it that you look for, um, you know, in somebody who, who wants to get involved in, in, in the mission? How, how do you assess that? Um, well, um, I'm personally a little bit of a human lie detector, so <laughs> uh, I have that going for me. But I think um, it, it goes back to what Lorian was saying a bit. It's, it's that passion, it's that spark. It's when you're talking to them about not only what they have done in their career, but what you're doing, and you see the light in their eye, and you know that they want to be part of it. Um, and, and sometimes I think there's, an in, look, interviewing is humans interviewing humans, so it's inherently flawed. No one's figured out the AI behind that yet. I'm sure that'll happen <laughs> in some room here today at the conference. But um, you're going to make a mistake because you know, there's only so much talking you can do exactly, yeah. and you're not, you know, doing the job together. But I think if you can get really good at digging into the passion, but then also pulling the thread to get more details on how they approach problems, how they solve things, what would it be like to work with them on a day-to-day -day basis? So the closer you can get to that, the better kind of assessment you're going to have. But again, it's not a foolproof plan. Yeah, there's no one size fits all approach is there when it, no. when it comes to that, that question as well. Um, so the, the tech industry for the past couple of years, you know, we, we've seen this kind of hyper growth, uh, you know, from in COVID times where you had companies thinking that this was the best time to grow and scale and hire the most amount of people for, you know, the biggest impact in terms of the, the product. And obviously the online adoption that you saw during COVID led to a lot of that uh, as well. Given the time that we're in today, and you know, companies have to take tough decisions. You've obviously seen 
cutbacks and, and layoffs and you know difficult decisions here and there. Um, when you kind of assess the, the the current market and you know the the ways in which you can kind of keep the ship sailing, but still try to kind of be mindful of you know the very human uh, you know element that you're dealing with um, when you're kind of hiring and trying to keep people um, within the company. How do you sort of approach this, uh, you know, in a, a compassionate way? Um, and and what, what is the sort of the latest in terms of how the tech industry is dealing with, with some of the, the issues, uh, you know, in, in the broader economy? Yeah, so I think what um, you're alluding to is, is layoffs and, and, you know, perhaps um, a recorrection of overhiring. The good news is that employment rates, you know, are still quite low. Right? So people, even though layoffs have happened, people are finding jobs. But I think what, what organizations have, have realized is that, um, you know, throwing bodies at a problem doesn't necessarily solve the problem, right? So um, even though there was a lot of growth and a lot of hiring, um, productivity might not have been where a lot of organizations yeah. wanted it to be. And, um, and there was this money in the bank and there was an opportunity and, and it made sense to do it at the time. But I think, you know, uh, when you're a young organization and you're growing and you're growing really fast, there comes a point where you kind of take a step back and you look at that growth and you say, what's the impact that it's having on the business? Right. Is it positive or negative? Um, do we hire the right people? Do we hire them in the right places? Um, because when you're moving fast, sometimes you don't see those things. And I think a lot of organizations over the last year and a half have taken a step back to, to say, okay, we're in hyper growth, like, but we, did we do it well, right? Yeah. And I think um, you know, some and many came to the conclusion that perhaps maybe they didn't do it right in the right areas or there was a sort of recorrection that, that needed to happen. Yeah, um, yeah just, just to reflect on that a little bit more, you know, were the decisions that were taken by some of those companies, were they the wrong decisions or was, was that just a reflection of the, the fact that you had to kind of be a bit more economical and, and scale back the, the ambition slightly? I don't know, Lorianne, if you have any... Yeah, I, I, I don't believe, you know, it's, 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 it was the wrong decision. I think it's the risk that you take as an entrepreneur because you're riding this boat and you're, you're thinking of how the context is going to look. You're thinking how much you're going to be able to actually do. And then you need to see what, what gets thrown at you and how you yeah. manage it. So you, you try to be playing all the time with what scale do I need? How, you know, how, what capacity do I need? it, And then you kind of have to be adjusting and tweaking along the way as long as you're learning. It's very easy to get into when you start in high, hyper growth mode. It's very easy for everyone to tell you, I can solve this with four more people. And you, okay. And then you start in that. And then in the moment you're like, wait, let's step back and think maybe it wasn't four more people. Maybe we needed this. So I think it's part of the growth process. And the beauty of it is that I've had people when they leave because of these things, changes that say in the company, they're like, thank you for the experience and being, having been yeah. part of that growth, having been part of the story, even though you had to shift directions a little bit for X or Y thing and you had to readjust. But the journey for them was really, was really what mattered. And they knew because you're, if you're joining a startup, you know you're doing something risky. Yeah. yeah. You know that you need, you're going to need to make changes along the way. And obviously it's... It's not the end of the road, is it? When you, when you when you do leave a, a company, I mean, you have that all, all that experience that you've kind of built up. You can take that transition some, somewhere else and, and take it to, to new experiences. Um, so, just I mean, going forward, you know, given the time that we're in, where where is tech going from here? You know, uh, I mean, it, it, I know it's a, it's a it's a loaded yeah. question, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? But uh, to to whittle it down a little bit, I mean, we're seeing lots of talk about artificial intelligence, and you know, just the amount of impact that can have um, on companies of all stripes. In the you know the, the people operations and, and HR, I'd, I'd be curious to know maybe Lorianne, if you could kind of um, weigh in on on how much that's that's impacting. You know, I'm super business. excited. I believe that maybe for the first time we're going to be able to build solutions through AI that can actually help us measure the human part of the business. Because when anybody asks you, so tell me a little bit about, you know, how do you know if HR is successful, if the people, and it's hard because you don't have real metrics, you don't have a way to tie all this data with the KPIs completely and understand and actually see, you know, how can you, how can you predict if a person is gonna be successful or not? And yeah. now we have the tools. So uh, hopefully people who are thinking, how to use those tools, of course, for the customer, of course, to keep building things and products, but also to enable and unleash people in a way that we can all be more productive and happy while we're being productive. 
Yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, for a very long time, there, there hasn't really been a lot of innovation in the space. And right now, you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs come with ideas, whether it's using AI or other, other technology, to really enable the people organization and organizations in general to have a more, um, you know, sort of full understanding of what's going on and being able to connect all the dots. And prior, you know, as the CHRO, all the tools they had to use were so fragmented. Yeah. None of them right. talked to each other. Like, you know, and you couldn't yeah. have a, a full picture. You had a spreadsheet here and a spreadsheet here. So we're getting to the point where, um, one, innovation is happening in the space, which I'm so excited about. And, and two, real meaningful change that has needed to happen because it's all a bit antiquated it is, is coming. So I'm, I'm hoping some of the folks in this room who are thinking about these problems um, will come talk to me at TCV. <laughs> Well, and, and on, on that note, Jessica, you know, you, you, you're here with, with, with the fund. Um, I would, I'd be curious to know the venture in, environment right now. I mean, are, are you seeing any signs of promising founders, you know, the, the, the new kind of wave of, of founders that are, that are coming in? How much is AI playing a role in that, that conversation? Is, there's, is a lo there's a lot of talk about AI, <laughs> um, which is exciting, you know, and there's um, so much that's going on. In, in that space that, you know, you can't help but get wrapped up into it. <laughs> However, um, in, a, in a good market or bad market, there are always interesting founders, right? And yeah. um, innovation is happening all the time. And, um, you know, you, you look at, like, when some of the most iconic companies have been created, it's been in, like, sort of down markets, right? Mm -hmm. And here come these, like, Folks, I don't know whether it's at Facebook or Apple, whoever. Um, and so, it's an exciting time, but it's a it's a different time. Um, yeah. And I think I saw um, Sequoia up here earlier talking that um, you know it's kind of slowed, and some are waiting, right? Um, but I think all the time and every time, there's brave entrepreneurs out there taking that risk. They have a vision and that never stops. And so that's, yeah. that's what's so exciting about the job is to be in those conversations and to know who those people are. And then, you know, if all things are right, you know, perhaps you connect and, yeah. you know, get involved. But um, it's, it's fascinating and, and inspiring. I just find that that whole journey and that whole step to really take that risk um, to be one I don't think most people would take. <laughs> it, is, it is a jump, you know, yeah. definitely, you know, um, to, to start a company is, is something else entirely. Um, and I mean, if you have any advice for the room, you know, I mean, there's plenty of folks out there who are, I'm sure, looking at <laughs> starting a company, maybe already in a successful tech company and want to know what is the right, you know, way to kind of go about it. How do they, I guess, you know, on the one hand, maybe, you know, Lorianne, you can share some perspectives on growing and, and scaling and, and building out the, the products and the, and the people teams. And then, Jessica, I'd love for you to weigh in on, you know, how do you approach, uh, you know, a venture investor? What, what's the right recipe to get a, a TCV uh, on, on board as, a, as an investor? Happy to. This, this answer could take so long if we had like the whole day. <laughs> um, but I want to structure it, you know, a little bit. In, in first, if, if you're building something, um, make sure you're building something that has a big market. Because if you want to have and you want to scale, you really need to be a big, uh, focus on a big market. Um, the other thing is that make sure that you build it with people that are as passionate about this with you. You spend up a lot of time with them. You spend time with them all the time. And at the end, it's, it's the talent. It's the people that you're building with that makes you know, the effort worthwhile to yeah. actually wake up in the morning and, and keep doing this all the time. And the third one is the power of your own mindset. I think that's what, that was one of the things that changed most when I became an entrepreneur and, and jumped from my corporate job to an entrepreneur, is being able to kind of block all the noise around you and just say, okay, because I have COVID ahead, right? So what can I focus that I can actually control, that I can actually do to move the needle today without listening to all the noise around me? And that actually helps you push every day forward until you build something amazing because you never stop building. And then you realize and you're like, wow, look at what I built. And it's, I'm so excited about what we're going to continue building in the future. Yeah. Well, um, I think to your point, 
you have to have a good market. You have to have a good idea yeah. and, a, and a good dam. You know, we focus more on later stage, both public and private. Um, but outside of the, the market and the idea and a decent ARR, <laughs> um, you really are betting on a team, right? And so it's the belief in the idea and the conviction around the, the business, but it's also the belief and conviction around the team because it's the people that are going to pull it off. And, um, and so when, when we're doing diligence and looking at organizations, of course, we're looking at the numbers, but we're also looking at, at the team and, and how impressive are they and, and their ability to work with each other because it's hard, right? <laughs> and you're going to hit some bumps in the road and how are they going to react when that happens? Creative differences, yep. differences around management and governance, all of these questions all these that, things. that come, come down, down the you track. Know, what, can they lead a group of people, you know, more yeah. than 10? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you know, growth stage, um, that's been a challenging part of, of the market. Um, you're seeing you know, the European, uh, State of European Tech report that was released today kind of shared a lot of insight about just how tough things are at um, at the moment. You know, in, in European venture, you've seen that kind of withdrawal of you know, US and, and Asian investors from the tech industry as a whole. Um, when it comes to growth stage, I mean, what is the outlook there? You know, uh, for, for TCV, I'd be curious to know, do you see companies managing to raise funds again at some point in the future? Where is the Where's the magic like timeline for when we start seeing an end to, you know, a lot of the, the the cold pressures that, that have faced the, the startup world um, for, for the last year, year or so? Well, you keep asking a lot of questions where I, I need my crystal ball and yeah. I, I, I left it <laughs> in the back. But um, yes, I think, I don't know what time. Like, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I don't think any of us were predicting that there'd be two wars happening. Like, you know, I mean, none, none of us could have even imagined COVID. Um, but I do think that, you know, capital is needed and, and innovation yeah. is happening. And so um, normalization will, will happen. And, and perhaps, you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, wasn't quite normal, right? So maybe we'll, right. we'll get back to a, a normal pace of, of investing in diligence. <laughs> a bit of a sort of step back to, you know, reality really, you know, right. in, in terms of what should be a, 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 good, a good business approach. Lorian, do you have any kind of outlook in terms of obviously no crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think every time somebody tries to predict when IPOs are coming back, for instance, it's, you know, oh, it's this year or no, it's, it's, it's next year, but it's never quite, quite the right time. But, you know, just in terms of when some of those issues start to thaw, I mean, obviously, you know, CAFAC being a global company, you know, and very late stage, you, you'll, you'll obviously have a, a sense of, you know, what things are currently like, you know, uh, within the business. I mean, when it comes to revenues, and it's almost a, a paradox, isn't it, with, with, with venture. On the one hand, you're kind of seeing revenues growing quite sharply, and for, for Kavak, I know that it, it's been uh, you know, a state of growth. On the other hand, you're seeing that kind of reaction from markets that isn't quite matching up. I mean, how do you like, bridge those two uh, conflicting things that, that are going on right now? Well, I think that you know, coming from emerging markets, you learn that we go through cycles of up and downs all the time. And, and we've yeah. had, you know, we launched, we started seven years ago, COVID wars. So it's kind of like we say, okay, let's breathe. This is a cycle that we're going through, you know, and, and you go a cycle in with everything is up. Then you go one when you need to, you know, tighten up the belt, make sure that you're very lean, that you're, you're operating, and then you kind of push for growth. So we're still expecting, we know that right now we're in that bottom cycle and expecting that it's going to change, hopefully sooner that, rather than later. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, got one minute left on, on the clock. Uh, I know I, I ask a lot of future looking questions and I know it's such a hard thing to predict the future. Nobody can quite know what is the, the, the perfect outcome looking ahead. But Jessica, Lorianne, you know, in terms of the, the HR functions and, and the, the people functions, what's that going to look like, you know, in, in five to 10 years time? I mean, it might look very different to what we have today, you know, the, the kinds of software that are out there, the, the, the operations. Um, what, what does the future hold for, you know, people and HR functions and how will tech kind of drive some of that, that, that innovation? 
Um, yeah, I need my crystal ball, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, look, I I I think that hopefully um, there's there's been an evolution in the function to become more strategic and uh, a better partner to the business, and that evolution has been happening over the last ten years. It's certainly been happening over the last five years, but really what's happened in the function today in terms of all the things that you have to be responsible for, of course, you're the, the HR strategist and, and sort of the culture and people strategist, but you're also the chief medical officer. You're the chief diversity officer. You're the chief operating officer in many extents. Like so much more than... <laughs> yeah, so, you know, expected. I think, you know, the, the function in terms of responsibility is evolving. And, and the great thing that we talked about a little bit earlier is that the technology now is like, coming up to play to match that evolution in, you know, yeah. in, the, in the function. So w what I'm hoping for is that you know, in five years, 10 years, sort of the, the function has really evolved to be the street strategic business partner that's really helping the organization scale. But then also, it has a supportive platform technology that allows it to, to deliver on that. And so, I don't know, that's my yeah. thought. <laughs> and, and I know we're out of time, but for me, my, my hope more than, you know, where it's going to go is that we're going to be able to use technology to understand people more and to understand how we can get people to be very passionate, but also deliver results through all of this, because we're very complex. And maybe through AI and all of these things, we are actually able to, to get that to a level in which we can understand and we can actually help people do better at, their, at whatever they're doing and, and, and just achieve their dreams. Totally. Well... Yeah. That's, that's the ultimate goal, making people more productive, right. happier, and uh, you know, wanting to be part of, of, of the journey. So yeah, I mean, Jessica, Laurie-Anne, thanks so much for taking the time and, and, and joining us to you know, have, have this, this fascinating chat on, on the state of uh, HR and, and people today. Thanks so much as well, everyone, for, for joining. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your slush. And, uh, get off and have a few drinkies. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a few people already uh, on, on that journey now. But uh, thanks again, guys. R really, uh, really you. enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.